In Rochford Dock the fleet lay moored, the streamers wavered in the wind. When Napoleon Bonaparte, he came on board, saying, where shall I some refuge find? Tell me, jovial sailors, tell me true. If to old England, if to old England, I shall sail with you. That verse comes from a 19th century broadside ballad which tells the story of Napoleon Bonaparte's surrender to the Royal Navy and his journey to the shores of England before being sent to his exile on the remote island of St Helena. Napoleon Bonaparte strides through the balladry of the British Isles as no other man has ever done and after more than 200 years his story is still being sung. I've been interested in his representation in English traditional song for many years and gave my first talk on the subject in 1976. But the discovery of this broadside a few years ago rekindled my interest and today I want to tell you about the broadside and about the three personalities that figure in the story. Napoleon Bonaparte, of course. Captain Frederick Maitland, the Scottish naval captain who has thrust unexpectedly into the spotlight of history, but whose account of Napoleon's voyage with him gives us so much interesting and useful information. And the frigate HMS Bellerophon, also known as Billy Ruffian, the stage upon which the drama was performed. I hope that you'll excuse my anthropomorphization of a wooden object, but a sailor would tell you that a ship has a personality as well as a will of its own. Our interest in the vessel is heightened when it's realised that it was known as the ship that dogged Napoleon's footsteps. Since she was the first ship to engage the enemy at the Battle of the Glorious 1st of June in 1794, which opened the naval conflict in the Revolutionary War. She then played her part in many subsequent battles, notably that of the Nile, and it was her decks that witnessed the surrender of Napoleon's sword in July 1815. But first, I should tell you about the song that tells this story. The broadside was published by the Liverpool printer Joseph Pannell, who gave it the title Napoleon Bonaparte's Exile to St Helena. It's paired with The Last Adieu. I discovered it a few years ago while searching the Bodleian Library's broadside collection online. After talking to Roy Palmer and other broadside ballad scholars, I realised that the ballad is, in fact, very rare, and that this may be the only edition surviving. It does not appear to have been sung widely, if at all, and was never noted by any of the Victorian or Edwardian song collectors. This may be because it was a reworking of the song William and Susan, also known as Black-Eyed Susan, or, more properly, Sweet William's Farewell to Black-Eyed Susan. That lyric was written around 1720 by John Gay, who also wrote The Beggar's Opera, and was set to music by a number of different composers before becoming linked inseparably with the tune written by Richard Leveridge. It was a very popular song and the story of Will Sweet William and Black-Eyed Susan entered popular culture. It was printed on a number of broadsides, sometimes together with companion pieces such as Sweet William's Happy Return to His Dear Susan, or 
Sweet Susan's Loyalty, as in this broadside by Dicey. In 1829, it was the inspiration for a play, Black-Eyed Susan or All in the Downs, by Douglas Gerald, in which the hero and heroine are both oppressed, with Susan's virtue threatened, and William condemned to death for striking his captain while defending her from his advances. William is saved when a paper is discovered in far-fetched circumstances which turns out to be his discharge from the Navy and is dated before the offence. The couple set out for a new life with the prospect of setting up a shop together. Less dramatically, the names of Sweet William and Black-Eyed Susan are preserved in many a garden in the form of Dianthus Barbatus and Rebecca Hirta, respectively. Napoleon Bonaparte's exile to St Helena is instantly recognisable as a reworking of Black-Eyed Susan if you know the song, which I must admit I didn't when I first saw the broadside. The kinship is quite clear when you look at the first verse and there are a number of phrases or even complete lines that are lifted from the original. It is, I think, a competent piece of writing, though some of its lines have rather too many feet. It does tell a story which, though it doesn't go beyond the point in time, is satisfyingly complete, and which tells us something of Napoleon's imagined emotions. So we're left with the question, is it good history? And my view is that it's not too wide of the mark. The broadside continues. Then Captain Maitland thus did say, Yes, to old England you shall go with me. Soon as Napoleon these words did hear, he bowed, he sighed, and hung his head, saying, My wife, my kingdom, and my glory is lost, and I'm an exile. I'm an exile on the ocean tossed. As the guns fell silent over the battlefield at Waterloo on the evening of the 18th of June 1815, Napoleon Bonaparte was already on his way to Paris, hoping against hope that he could hold on to his position as Emperor of France. He rapidly discovered that he'd been deposed, that the new government had stripped him of his titles and privileges, and that it was not safe for him to stay in Paris, lest he was seized for trial and possible execution. He made his way south, pursued by those unfriendly forces, sometimes helped by those still loyal to him, sometimes greeted with indifference by officials who recognised that they no longer had anything to fear from a former ruler for whom the wheel of fortune had turned so decisively. His plan was to take a ship and slip through the English blockade to seek a new life in America. He knew that there were naval vessels at Rochefort, the loyalties of whose commanders he could rely upon. So with his household and his possessions, he headed for the Charente Maritime. The Royal Navy had, though, anticipated his intentions, and Admiral Hottam was sent out with a squadron whose task was to prevent Napoleon leaving France. A flotilla of three ships, under the command of Captain Frederick Maitland in HMS Bellerophon, was in position off the Basque Roads, the approach to Rochefort, to block any attempt to escape from there. Bonaparte arrived in Rochefort on the 3rd of July, hotly pursued by his French enemies. Two frigates were prepared to carry him and his retinue to America, 
but it soon became clear that Maitland presented a major obstacle to this plan. Bonaparte sent two of his aides to talk to him and see if they could negotiate a passage or a transfer to a ship bound for the United States. Maitland's orders would not allow this, but when, two days later, he was asked if he would take Napoleon to England, he agreed, though with no guarantees as to his treatment when he arrived. Early on the 15th of July, the brig Apervier put out from Rochefort with Napoleon Bonaparte and his retinue on board. As the vessel made its way in light winds towards the Bellerophon, Maitland sent his first lieutenant in a boat to collect him. Underlying his impatience was Maitland's worry that Admiral Hottam's ship Superb had been seen in the offing and he was concerned that Hottam would require Bonaparte to go to him. As the former emperor came aboard, he was greeted with a boatswain's pipe and a marine guard. Unsure how he should greet the fallen tyrant, Maitland had fallen back on the naval custom that full honours, such as a gunnery salute and manning the yards, were not given before eight o'clock in the morning. The seamen who high upon the yards Rocked by the billows to and fro. Soon as Napoleon's voice they heard, Like lightning they flew down below. All rushed on deck to see this mighty man, who oft times threatened, who oft times threatened to invade our native land. There are several surviving descriptions of Napoleon's time on the Bellerophon from the ship's officers and crew, and they confirm that the crew were indeed on deck when Napoleon boarded the ship. After he'd been shown to his quarters, Bonaparte asked Maitland if he could see round the vessel, and while he was doing so he talked to several of the officers and men. They and Maitland were subjected to a barrage of questions about the ship and its operation. The captain had given up his own quarters to Bonaparte and his entourage. Several tons of baggage and the rest of 50 people who Bonaparte had brought with him were loaded and stowed, though Bonaparte's travelling coach was left behind. The French party made themselves comfortable and that evening Hottam and Maitland were invited to join Napoleon in the great cabin for a dinner prepared by his chefs, the first of many fine dinners that would be hosted by the former emperor in the coming days. The boatswain gave the dreadful word, the ship's with billowing bosom spread. No longer must they stay on shore. He looked, he sighed, he hung his head. As the shores of France retired from his view. Adieu, adieu, he cried. Adieu, adieu, he cried. Ungrateful France, adieu. On the 17th of July, the Bellerophon left Rochefort in company with Superb and the other British ships. The Bay of Biscay proved kind for once, and most of the refugees were able to adapt to the motion of the ship without undue distress. 
Two days out, the midshipmen put on a play, the poor gentlemen, to entertain their passengers. Napoleon was greatly amused by the sight of large young Englishmen squeezing into women's clothing. Believe no more what the Frenchmen say, they doubt within their wavering minds. They told me if I with them would stay firm in their cause, I should them find. Past experience tells me that they are untrue, and I forever, and I forever bid them all adieu. Bonaparte rose early in the morning of the 23rd of July to catch his last glimpse of France, the lighthouse on the Isle of Ushant off the coast of Brittany. One of the midshipmen from Bellerophon reports that he sat for five hours, lost in thought as the coast of France disappeared from view. That evening he saw Devonshire for the first time as the peaks of Dartmoor came into view. Bellerophon and her companions made her way into Tor Bay, where she anchored off Brixham at dawn on the 24th of July, 1815. This is the point at which the ballad ends, but I'm going to finish the tale since I believe that this is one of the most fascinating episodes in Napoleon's career and the only one where the British people, rather than their military and political representatives, get to play a part in his story. At first, Hotham and Maitland tried to keep Bonaparte's presence on board a secret, and all contact with the shore was forbidden. Hotham, meanwhile, sent one of his officers post-haste to London with a message to the Admiralty, but such a momentous arrival could not be kept secret long. Two boys in a rowing boat picked up a bottle, surreptitiously dropped into the water by one of the crew with the message, We've got Bonaparte aboard. Soon boats started to make their way out towards the ship, trying to catch a glimpse of the man who'd been the cause of so much turmoil across the world. For the next two weeks, Napoleon was the centre of attention for the British public, not just in the southwest but in the country as a whole. The numbers of boats continued to increase, as did the concern of the authorities that an attempt would be made to free Napoleon. After two days, the order was given to bring Bellerophon into Plymouth Sound, where she was to be guarded by two additional naval ships, with instructions to keep sightseers at a cable's length from the frigate and her controversial passenger. But the ancestors of the Plymouth boatmen, who now offer trips to see the dockyards and warships, were quick to take advantage of the public interest. The account given in his diary by General George Dyer gives us a picture of what it was like. We went off in the Myrmidon's boat with Lieutenant Jenkins to see Bonaparte and fortunately got a good view of him. He came to the gangway and stood with his hat off for a considerable time, and afterwards at the stern window. This was about six o'clock in the evening. The sea was beautifully smooth, which was covered with boats and so crowded near the ship that the people appeared as though standing on the shore. When I reflected on the wonderful events that had taken place, I could scarcely believe, while looking at Bonaparte, that I really saw this man who'd caused so much blood to be spilt and so much misery to all Europe, and that he was at that moment a prisoner in a British man of war and in an English port. One of the boats which held Maitland's wife Caroline was allowed to approach closer. 
Napoleon had already commented favourably to Maitland on the portrait of her that hung in his cabin, and now he told him that the portrait did not do her justice. He had a conversation with her, and told her that the orders that prevented her coming aboard were too harsh. After two days of this, Maitland reported a respite on Saturday the 29th of July, as heavy rain kept people indoors all day. On the Sunday, though, the fleet of small boats was greater than ever, and he estimated that there were more than a thousand of them, each with no less than eight passengers. The guard boats could no longer keep them away, though they fired shots over their heads and deliberately rammed some of the more blatant trespassers as they crowded round the Bellerophon. It's this scene that was captured by French artist Jules Giraudet some years after the event. Giraudet seems to have done his research well. Napoleon stands at the stern rail of the Bellerophon looking down on the crowds. The picture includes the incident reported in an appendix to Maitland's account of the midshipmen turning the ship's hoses onto the boats below, for which they got into deep trouble. The women are in all their finery, just as was described and which led Napoleon to comment to Maitland on the beauty of English women and the difficulty of telling their station based on dress alone. There is the sense of danger, shown by the terror of the women in the foreground, the boy being plucked from the water while the boatmen focus on keeping the boats apart. There were a number of accidents, and the newspapers reported some drownings. Above all, there is the excitement, the engagement of members of the crowd with the figure above. The level of excitement was quite extraordinary. Even Napoleon's clothing, which was sent ashore to be washed, became an opportunity for the Plymouth washerwomen who, for a modest sum, would allow men to try on Napoleon's shirts. The root of that excitement is a part of the enigma. What caused this extraordinary interest in Napoleon? It had started while he was in exile for the first time, when English tourists flocked to Elba to catch a glimpse of him, and it was said every sea captain had a picture of him in his cabin. I've heard it said that the British public looked to Napoleon as more worthy of their admiration than their own leaders, and there was certainly some fear among politicos that he would become a focus for revolution. I think the truth is that it was a Georgian manifestation of the cult of celebrity that we're so familiar with today. Maitland thought that Bonaparte sought to stoke that celebrity, and so to gain sympathy by his regular appearances. The government, though, had made up his mind, as widely predicted, and on the 4th of August the Bellerophon sailed back to Torbay to meet HMS Northumberland, which was to carry him to St Helena. Three days later, with only a handful of hardy spectators looking on, Napoleon was transferred on to the Northumberland. On leaving the Bellerophon, he thanked the officers and then bowed several times to the crew. So, Bellerophon's part in the story came to an end after 24 momentous days, and Bonaparte, the fascinating monster, sailed on the Northumberland to his lonely exile on St Helena and his death there only six years later. His story is, of course, well known, but what about the other two actors in this drama? Let's look first at Frederick Maitland, whose memoir, The Surrender of Napoleon, is the backbone of this account. Maitland was a career naval officer, and the son of a naval officer who had fought with distinction under Rodney. Like HMS Bellerophon, he was present at many of the important naval actions of the French Revolutionary Wars, since he was there on the glorious 1st of June to watch Bellerophon fire the opening shot. He was also at the Battle of the Nile, when he saw her take on L'Orient, and survive the encounter, though 
dismasted and badly damaged when that great ship exploded into fragments. And of course the voyage with Napoleon, which, despite the attacks of politicians for his allegedly favourable treatment of the erstwhile scourge of Europe, did him no harm in the eyes of the navy. After leaving Bellerophon, he continued in command of ships with some important assignments transporting foreign royalty across the world and was promoted to Rear Admiral. He was made Admiral Superintendent of Portsmouth Naval Yards in 1832, during which time he had the opportunity to secure the figurehead and some of the stern carvings from Bellerophon and place them in the Naval Museum in Portsmouth where you can see them today. In 1837, he was appointed Commander-in-Chief of the East Indies and China Station, where he died of illness two years later, on board HMS Wellesley off Bombay. Our principal actress suffered a less glamorous fate. Just three weeks after her famous prisoner stepped down from her decks, the Bellerophon sailed round the coast to Sheerness in the Thames estuary, where she was stripped of her weapons and stores and even of her topmasts and rigging. She was paid off on the 13th of September 1815, and her crew, who we know from the records to have included men who had been barbers, basket makers, brush makers, blacksmiths, button makers, cabinet makers, carters, farmers, glaziers, grooms, hatters, millers, plumbers, weavers and wheelwrights went on to other ships or returned to their previous occupations. Bellerophon, like many of the ships of Nelson's navy, was laid up as a prison hulk in the Thames estuary, a kind of exile of her own. She was stripped internally and her former gun decks filled with iron cages to accommodate over 400 convicts waiting to be transported to Australia. It was such a hulk that Dickens described in Great Expectations and from which Magwitch escaped to terrify and then befriend young Pip Pirrip. In 1823 Bellerophon was refitted to hold just the boy convicts and then her name was changed to Captivity, so that her former name could be reused for a new warship. After a decade moored in the mouth of the Medway, her masts and sails were refitted, and she made her last voyage to Plymouth to hold convicts who would be working in the naval dockyards there. By 1836, however, enough prisoners had been transported to Australia to solve the problem of overcrowding in England's jails, and captivity was sold to be broken up. Some of her timbers were used in the construction of buildings in the Barbican area of Plymouth. And there I will end our voyage. I hope you've enjoyed this little cruise, the result of a single rare ballad that fired my interest and my passion for research. Here's a list of the books and articles that I read to prepare this paper, and which I can thoroughly recommend, though I would single out three in particular. You should certainly read Frederick Maitland's memoir, which you can find on archive.org and which is superbly readable. David Cordingley's book, Billy Ruffian, is a very interesting and unique biography of a ship. And Carola Uman's Britain Against Napoleon is a joy to read, full of enough nuggets of social history to delight anyone who's interested in the period. So, thank you. And if you have got any queries... Do drop me a line.